Feeding 105,000 people every week is no small feat. But for Eric Cooper, CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank, it's about more than just meals. It's about solving hunger at its roots. Hunger really is a policy choice. If our community can gain the conscience and have the compassion, we could see a day when hunger doesn't exist. I'm Corey Ames, and this is Ensemble Texas. In this episode, we're pulling back the curtain on the incredible work of the San Antonio Food Bank, how they address hunger today while creating solutions for tomorrow. Eric shares the strategies that make this possible, from food rescue to workforce development, and even the ways food can heal more than just empty stomachs. Food is magical, right? It has this power to bring people to the table. It's culture, it's tradition, it's the holidays, it's the first date, it's love, it's everything. There's more to this story than just logistics. We're talking about why most people in those food lines are working families. Moms who are employed but underpaid, making tough choices like whether to pay for groceries, or pay for rent. Most of who we provide food to are housed um, versus the homeless. Stick around to hear why Eric believes hunger is ultimately solvable and how the San Antonio Food Bank's mission goes beyond putting food on the table for families today to building a resilient, thriving community for all. Well, Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and uh, I know it's a, a lengthy career here at the food bank, and so things might look a bit different than when you started, but I'd love to, to start perhaps there. Yeah. Uh, it's been over 20 years serving as the CEO of the food bank. I'm curious, does it feel like the same job that you're showing up to every day as you did back in the early 2000s? Yeah, it's a it's, um, great question. I mean, I think sometimes just for context, making sure people understand that the San Antonio Food Bank is not alone. We're a part of a national organization called Feeding America. There's 200 food banks across the U.S. Each food bank has a service territory. So ours is actually 29 counties. And all 254 counties is divided up uh, in the great state of Texas by food banks that regionally kind of serve those geographical areas. So in our local 29 counties, we have about 800 different partners that help us in the food distribution. Many of these are traditional nonprofits or churches or schools, um, but it's those pantries that mm. an individual in a neighborhood might go to to actually pick up a food box or get a meal. It's our privilege to partner with that network. We also run our own programs, which sometimes are highlighted in the news and create a paradigm for how people think we work. But boy, when I started um, 23 years ago here at the San Antonio Food Bank, we were much smaller. In some ways, size is not a sign of success, right? It's just a demonstration of the need and our passionate um, attempt to urgently address the food insecurity that is grown as our city has grown. Hmm. And um, today, you know, we're a large nonprofit that um, is committed to high integrity in how we operate the business um, to be extremely efficient in how we steward what's donated to us and then leveraging the biggest impact. And, and we deliver impact in this cool way because food is magical, right? Mm. It, it, it has this power to bring people to the table. It's culture, it's, it's, it's tradition, it's the holidays, it's, it's the first date, it's love, it's, it's everything. And so bringing the magic of food in, a, in such a dynamic way allows us not just to address hunger, but um, other insecurities that a household might have that we try to make secure. And excited to have this conversation. Well, maybe along those lines as, as to things that uh, maybe our, our greater San Antonio community not, might not be aware of, uh, what do you feel like is maybe most misunderstood about how the food bank operates generally or just perhaps left out of the greater narrative uh, in San Antonio and beyond? Yeah, so we feed on a weekly basis about 105,000 people. Um, Easier said than done. I mean, think about 105,000 people coming for dinner. Um, it takes a lot of food to meet that need. 
We try to align the right foods in the right amount at the right time. But I think the misconception sometimes is who's in that line. So often people think that the food bank really just serves um, the housing insecure, the homeless, right? Like they, they must be homeless to get food from the food bank. Most of who we provide food to are housed um, versus the homeless. You know, people are surprised to learn that hunger is very biased to females. It tends to slant to Hispanics. So she's a Latina. She's employed, which again, most people would assume those that access our food are unemployed, but more often they're underemployed and she's a parent, she's got kids. So you think of this Latina who's uh, got kids, who's working, but just not making enough to make ends meet. And that's where she's gonna lean on the food bank. I use the phrase rent eats first in every household budget. It just eats up everything and there's nothing left over for food. And when you think about the high cost of rent combined with utility bills that can be incredibly burdensome along with any transportation expenses to get to and from work, there just isn't enough money and that mom is making the decision, do I pay this bill or do I buy food? And we would encourage her to come here mm -hmm. to get food and to get programming that might be able to then bring some stability to the household. Ultimately, we would prefer that her income increase, right? And therefore her need for coming here is lessened. Um, I can't do that alone. Uh, I need her employer. I need good public policy to also lean in if we're gonna reduce the number of households coming to get food from the food bank. Hmm. Well, I mean, if you could say more along that point specifically, of course the food bank can't do everything in the world. Uh, and we would hope that uh, in the long term, it's you're not serving the same families, the same individuals repeatedly over time. Uh, and so how do you all think about that balance between you know, long term, very systemic, involving the greater community of San Antonio policy, business, you know, and individuals uh, versus addressing the short term, very critical essential needs that this family needs to eat this evening? How do you strategize between those two and find your appropriate role? Well, we definitely do it with jargon. And I'm going to share some of it. So, you know, we tend to think of the two sides of our work as feeding the line, the need for food immediately, and then shortening the line. How do we how do we get people out of it in that parable of giving a fish or teaching the fish? I think it's those two sides that have to be done in tandem. I always modify the parable that, um, you know, if, if you don't pack a tuna fish sandwich, she's not going to meet you at the dock, right? That Latina, again, she's working, she's a parent. She would love to learn how to fish, mm -hmm. but if her babies go hungry, if she goes hungry, she's not gonna meet you at the dock. She's not gonna go on that expedition to try to learn. If you didn't investigate to, to find out if the fishing industry is actually a living wage that will transition her to a better life, you're just frustrating her. So. You can't ignore the fact that people have to eat while you're combining a strategy to move them forward. And I think the food bank has a strategy of what we call food for today, food for tomorrow, and then food for a lifetime. Our food for today work is the physical groceries and meals that we distribute. When someone's hungry, their cupboards are bare, their refrigerator's empty, Anywhere in our 29 counties, they either call us or they walk in or they connect online. We're going to address that today need with a referral to one of our 800 partners. We're going to connect them to some of our programs that might be in community giving away the physical food. And if you think in a 12 month period, the value of that is about $180 million worth of food. So in and out of the food bank every day is about eight to 12 tractor trailer loads of food. All of that comes in, it goes out, and that is what we're doing to solve the immediate symptom of hunger today. But while we're connected to that individual and family, we have this conversation, food for tomorrow. And for us, that means, have you thought about applying for public benefits? Programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, or Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, or 
Do you need health insurance, maybe Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program? If you're a senior, long-term care, all of these are federal safety nets that for our community, based on fear, stigma, they oftentimes go unutilized. Mm. The state has policies that can sometimes be barriers to participation. It used to be in Texas, when you applied for food stamps, you had to be finger imaged. It was kind of associated as committing a crime. And so nobody wanted to apply for those benefits. With improved policy, we were able to remove that strategy that kept families from actually getting the help that they desperately needed. Mm. From my vantage point, man, if I could get someone on SNAP, maybe it's less demand here at the food bank, right? That family now has access to groceries at HEB or Walmart, and maybe it's more culturally relevant and um, the, the varieties of food that they know and are familiar with. That value was estimated in total about $250 million a year in our Food for Tomorrow strategy. So it's actually a bigger benefit to the households we serve, but oftentimes most people in San Antonio have no clue that the food bank is working in that space. Mm -hmm. One simple way to think of it is when you think about applying for SNAP, the former food stamp program in Texas, the written application used to be called the 1010, and it's not that different from the 1040. Most US citizens don't attempt the 1040 on their own, right? Mm. You go to a third party tax preparer, or if you're like me, you use TurboTax. <laughs> the food bank became the TurboTax of the 1010, right? We, we help families navigate that process to actually get a return. And those returns bring household stabilization. Once a household's stable, right? They've got those basic needs starting to be met based on their income, low, they qualify for that program. The next opportunity is what we call food for a lifetime, and that's really about workforce development, job training, job placement. How can we get their wage up? And this is a challenge, I think, across the United States. It's known as the benefits cliff. Mm -hmm. You might be earning a wage, and when you stack benefits, your household's you know, somewhat stable. If you start to increase your wage, the benefits might drop off. That's the cliff where you need to take a more quantum leap in an hourly rate forward or higher to actually bridge what you lost mm -hmm. to that new wage. And so working through those strategies, but really I think that's where there's opportunity for that public policy to think through. How do we make a system that helps people move forward and not keep them hostage to a benefit, right? When someone turns down a wage increase because they lose their childcare, mm -hmm. the system isn't working, right? Um, so, but most policy, it's to, it's to sustain life, not a lifestyle. And so, hey, policymakers, they're concerned about sometimes the make and model of a car someone drives, or hey, where did they shop and what did they eat? And you know, it's not fair that they get this when this person doesn't get that. In the equity, the equality of it, I think we can be better as a community. And I think that's ultimately what the food bank's trying to bring to light is the areas where we need to make improvement we're going to address the immediate symptoms today, tomorrow, and for a lifetime, but we can't do it alone. We need strategic partners in government and, and in business to ultimately have a community where everyone thrives. Mm, absolutely. Well, and it's, it's just a challenge to think that uh, you're talking about predominantly the communities or the families that you serve are working families. And so th those families have jobs. And there's wages attached to them. And it's unfortunate to believe that that wage isn't sufficient just to be able to, to provide basic food security. Yeah. And so that seems a whole, like a whole problem of economics. And you know, perhaps that's out of the scope of this conversation. Um, but I'd be curious, Eric, and, and maybe it's you know, a combination of, of everything in between. Along that laundry list of items, has there been anything that you've realized in hindsight was most effective 
uh, for y'all to implement uh, or, or activate in programming for the food bank. Was there anything that felt like some sort of kind of magic on off switch to some degree that made a big impact or is it just a combination of all of them together? Yeah, it's so complex. You know, I, if I were to say, you know, what are the trends that are winning? Um, I'd say one, just the concept of food banking. And when we think of that, it's tied to food rescue. It's the reality that there's a lot of food waste in the United States and food that's produced to be eaten, it's, it's best and highest use, sometimes doesn't happen. And there's logistics and timing and you know produce that might be expiring. All of that food waste, when captured for its best and highest use, someone eats it, mm. that there's a mechanism by which those that have it can donate it and there's an entity to get it to those that need it. So number one, the thing that we're most proud about is the fact that we keep food from going into the landfill and get it on the table for hungry families. And that is not only good for feeding the hungry, but it's fantastic for the environment, right? And the economics around that, as I mentioned, about $180 million worth of food or eight to 12 semi truck loads that are not going into the landfill every day mm. that get on the plate of a hungry family and actually nourishes them. I think around really addressing the root causes, food is medicine, food is health. Um, there's four big barriers to nutrition. When you think about it, income is the biggest driver. How much you make determines how well you eat. Geography is the next big barrier where you live. You could live in a food desert urban, rural? Do you have access to a grocery store? Education. You might have access to produce, but you never were taught how to cook. And mm -hmm. how do I make a recipe that my kids will like? The fourth big barrier is really the commerce around food and how it's marketed, displayed. It's weird, right? Sometimes food that's most accessible is most affordable. It tastes really good, but it's terrible for our health consistently, right? okay in moderation, but the dollar menu shouldn't be a staple in anyone's diet, right? And sadly, that's the reality because that's what's close, that's what's cheap, that's what's available in this society of such fast pace. When you think about how food is delivered, when we think about just at a grocery store, we used to mostly shop, but now we do curbside pickup, we do home delivery, there's so many different ways and that's a societal convenience, but the families that we feed, they can't afford those upcharges and convenience, but they're still living in the same economy. She's riding the bus. She's got kids that have to get to childcare. She's got to get to her job on time or she's fired. She could really use a curbside pickup, mm -hmm. but she's got to go into the store. All of those kind of things I think are challenges, but when I think of our food as medicine work to really get people access to healthy food, the work that we're doing around nutrition education on recipes and teaching how to cook, that's having a direct blow on diabetes rates. We're helping families live healthily. We're helping families live longer, no longer, right? Should it be acceptable that your zip code determines your life expectancy, mm -hmm. we should be counteracting zip code geographical barriers to health in a way that's equitable and allows for those communities to get access to healthy food. And I'm super proud of the work that our team is doing, super excited about the work that our farm team's doing to really educate where food comes from. When you think about United States and the fact that we're so blessed with incredible agriculture but if we don't look after it, right? If we're not responsible with land, with water, good stewardship, we could all be hungry. Mm -hmm. And so good policy, knowing your farmers, thinking locally, um, thinking sustainability, you know, those are all good things in making sure that we all have access to the food that our bodies need to grow healthy and strong. So between our food rescue and our nutrition, food as medicine work, I'd say the last thing is just you know, really being a place where people um, can live their best life. And my staff hear me say, the food bank feeds the entire community. And what we mean by that is just that we serve both those with resources 
and those without. When we serve those with resources, we serve people in their giving of food, time through volunteerism, dollars through charitable contributions, and their voice. And I'm grateful for you lending your voice and telling the story of the food bank. But everyone that has the ability can give all four of those things. Um, and when they're doing that, they're becoming a superhero. They're living their best life. They're, they're exercising less selfishness and increase selflessness. And I think sometimes being the person their parents wanted them to be or their God wants them to be. Um, we have such a diverse faith community here in San Antonio. And, and recently was at our local um, Hindu temple where they were expressing when they're in the service of humanity, they're only in the service of their deity mm. and the importance of their faith tradition to help those in need. And the food bank is a vehicle by which they can do that. They have Sunday school, we have the lab. Mm. And this is the place where people can actually exercise their faith, they can live in their finest hour and they can be a better person. And the cool thing is, is they feel better from doing it. Like oftentimes we hear that, man, I came to help someone else, but I think I walked away with a greater benefit than what I delivered. And it's a pretty cool space to work in when you see that happen time and time again. Obviously our mission is to help those without resources. And so when that mom is without food, she's transformed, she's strengthened. We're helping her be a mom. We're helping her provide for her kids. We're helping her get through either a birthday that she didn't think she was gonna be able to provide for or the holiday. And probably one of my most sobering experiences came for Thanksgiving when a mom came in needing to provide for her family but didn't have a turkey. Failing to have a turkey on the most celebrated food day of the year mm -hmm. when her other extended family were coming to her house, she was expected to provide. And the reality was she was not going to be able to meet the expectation because she couldn't afford it. Mm. And that fear, that stress, that anxiety of not being able to provide, to, to be that person, right, was in jeopardy. And when we could strengthen her in her role in meeting that expectation, it's not just a physical nourishment, but it's a mental health strengthening. And I think in this time of such extreme mental health stress, food, again, in its magical way, is helping to heal what's broken in so many of us. Absolutely. It seems as if the food bank facilitates a really incredible opportunity to connect greater with our, our food, where it comes from, the, the purpose of it, our community, and as well as a result of the service, it seems ourselves, too. And and. I, I'm interested, Eric, as, as dynamics are changing in San Antonio, it's a rapidly growing city. We're experiencing record numbers of, of growth in population. We're as well seeing uh, a boom economically. How does that uh, change your perspective and what you're seeing in the community that, that y'all serve and your place in San Antonio as you uh, forecast the future? The history of Texas and the Alamo probably would say, so goes, you know, the Alamo, so goes Texas, right? And so I think San Antonio is, is in a lot of ways uniquely positioned on so many issues. You know, I would lead with just our proximity to the border and Mexico and the fact that we're all human beings and we all have a need for nourishment. And so Sometimes borders are challenged with immigration barriers and challenges that sometimes get political, but food um, is basic. And so as we see our brothers and sisters seeking asylum from worn, torn or uh, economically broken nations, that opportunity when they're seeking um, immigration status and become a migrant, that we have an opportunity to feed who's hungry without political judgment, but just to, to be there to nourish, I think is an example of the highest form of humanity. And so I, I extend my gratitude to those donors that care about every human being. But I understand the donor that suggests, Eric, that's not my priority. I would much more prefer that you serve domestic neighbors, not migrants. And 
we can segregate that investment to make sure that any donor's contribution goes to who they want to help. Some, it might be just children. Some might be just seniors. This is a place where all of the donations can still flow, but we can hold the values of all of those that give in the same plate, if you will. Um, I think that the growth needs to understand that ideally all boats rise in the harbor. You know, as we grow, do we have the infrastructure to make sure that there's enough affordable housing for the, those wages that haven't kept up or we're making policy changes that enable upward mobility and wage. You know, I tend to think of the pandemic as an interesting exercise. Before the pandemic, there was a real effort to try to bring personal time off to food service workers. Mm -hmm. And it was met with lots of opposition. I mean, small businesses, restaurants, um, et cetera, worry that providing PTO would financially bankrupt them and make the business unprofitable. And I run a business, I have those same fears. You're trying to balance revenue and expenses. So I, I don't want to villainize them, but as a human being, all of us are gonna get sick. All of us are gonna run into situations that you can't go to work and all of us need a break. Mental health's important. So being able to take vacation, even though you can't afford to go anywhere, but just you know, maybe get some work done at the house is a is a human need. And and to think that business was not wanting to provide that because the worker, again, the Latina, she's always gone to work sick. If she didn't, she doesn't get paid. And when she doesn't get paid, she can't make her rent. Then the pandemic hits and there's this awakening to a virus that would spread if someone's sick. So we told her, hey, if you have these symptoms, stay home, don't come to work. In some cases, provisions were made to protect her income. But as the vaccine came out, as the economy opened up, we moved back into this kind of don't ask, don't tell position. She's going to work sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's sucking it up because she needs her wage. And, you know, I think as a society, there are some basic elements of employment that should be in place. And from my vantage point, if the private businesses can't provide it, that's a role for government or the public sector to really provide. In the private, you've got the charitable sector too. And I mentioned it earlier in our conversation. I mean, when you think about a household spend on food um, or the sources that a household might get food, it's your earned income for the families we provide food to that provides the most. Mm -hmm. So it's of their own work, their own hand that puts food on the table. The next big chunk would be government. So those federal programs like the school lunch and breakfast program, the SNAP program or the WIC program, all of those federal nutrition programs start to round out the plate. And then the charitable sector, the food bank, we're actually the smallest and probably the least stable. We're reliant on food waste and charitable contributions. Um, and during the pandemic, we had to get a bigger part of that plate because people's income shrunk. Mm -hmm. Government did a little bit more, but did it in different ways. And some received a benefit, others didn't. It needs to be consistent. And I think the ideal way would be an income strategy. I tend to think food is not the answer to solve hunger, money is. It's really an income issue. It's not a food issue when it comes to addressing hunger. If we can get wages up, gotta control expenses and inflations cause some harm, but then you're gonna be able to have families that can be much more stable in our society and that's what the community I wanna live in. I wanna San Antonio where everyone thrives not where there's winners and losers. And I think that opportunity is ours. It's a choice. Mm. You know, hunger really is a policy choice. If our community can gain the conscience and have the compassion and lean on elected officials and decision makers, 
corporate CEOs, I think we could see a day when hunger doesn't exist and everyone thrives. Absolutely. And I, I likewise share the sentiment. That's a community that I want to live in. And it kind of seems as we approach this period of, of growth, it feels a bit inevitable. We're not going to slow that down, both population or as well how, how different sectors of the economy uh, twist and turn. But it seems to be more about what constraints we start to accept, You know, what things are unacceptable for us as a community here in San Antonio, what we think is okay or not mm -hmm. for our own you know, fellow neighbors here. Uh, and, and so, Eric, I want to be respectful of your time. The, the final question I have for you uh, now, we, we brought it up already, but after a, a couple decades here at the food bank, uh, what makes you still feel very excited and energized about this work today? Things that you're very uh, 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 enthusiastic to share with others as they engage and connect with the food bank. You know, I'm so blessed to come to work every day and, and see um, the number of volunteers that walk in our door that renew my faith in humanity and goodness and people that are giving of their time. And um, they, they, they lean in alongside of my staff who, again, inspire me because of their passion and their commitment to making our city a better place. And so it's a pretty good group to travel with. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when we look at our donor database, all of the food companies that give, the, those that financially give, our, our board, I don't feel like I'm ever alone, but it really is an army of people that are, that are working. And, and that, that gives me optimism that, that together we can do our mission and have success. Coming out of the pandemic, we really challenged our thinking we really were focused on hunger and food insecurity. When we thought about trying to build a secure community, a food secure community, it seemed inadequate. And so we really started to think, what would it be to have a secure San Antonio? Mm -hmm. And you know, thinking about what are the pillars of need? And if you could help people not just be food secure, but be housing secure, if they weren't just housing secure and food secure, but they were secure in their education, they, they had access to good quality education and employment. I mean, think about being secure in your employment. So that became a little bit of our mantra, not that we're in any way knowing anything about housing or education or, or employment, but how could we think of who we partner with and where we do food distributions, that food for today, $180 million in food, how could we strategically invest it in partnership in those sectors of food, housing, education, and employment? And what it brought to the table was some incredible partnerships in education. So one brag is, man, Mike Flores uh, at Alamo Colleges, um, students oftentimes don't finish their degree because of stress related to household expenses and putting food on the table for themselves and their family. So they drop out. Dr. Flores would say, hey, my biggest competition for students isn't UTSA, it's poverty. And if I could invest food in partnership with Alamo Colleges to help students get through their degree and actually graduate with an education that could allow them competitiveness in the marketplace to get a better job, that could help in making not just someone food secure, but potentially housing and education and employment secure. So it's a little bit of what we're trying to develop in partnership with so many sectors, but I think that holistic approach, nobody's doing it alone, is something that we've learned um, is just the reality, right? Alone, we, we go fast. Together, we go far. And it's pretty incredible to be a part of that type of community that wants to travel together. And I'm so grateful for everyone we travel with. I just want to thank Eric Cooper for joining me to share the inspiring work of the San Antonio Food Bank. From feeding over 105,000 people each week to addressing systemic barriers like food security and workforce development, it's clear that hunger is more than just a food issue. It's about equity, opportunity, and compassion.
If this conversation sparked your interest, I'd encourage you to learn more about the San Antonio Food Bank and consider how you might get involved in their important work or with an organization that's comparable in your community. And if you enjoyed this episode of Ensemble Texas, check out some of our other videos where we explore stories of resilience and innovation all across San Antonio and Texas. Soon to come, we'll have a part two with the San Antonio Food Bank, where I speak with their director of food sustainability, Mitch Hagney, on the 75 acres that the food bank farms within San Antonio. So be sure to subscribe and look out for that. Thanks for watching or listening. Until next time.